Hello, I'm John Spritzler, a member of People for Democratic Revolution in Boston. Uh, we have our webpage, pdrboston.org. I'd like to just uh, introduce you to one of the pages. Uh, it's a page that the, that the link to which is, uh, it says, your issue is our issue. Uh, we've got a, a partial list of problems, it's a work in progress, a partial list of problems caused by the dictatorship of the rich. And we discuss briefly the ways that these problems can be solved with real quality and real democracy, in other words, with egalitarianism. And the interesting point to note is that uh, the problems are very diverse, but the solutions are all the same, real equality and real democracy, which illustrates that there's really just one big problem, which is we live under a dictatorship of the rich, and there's one big solution, egalitarian revolution. So let's look at some specific issues. Schools. Well, big money is turning school, public schools, into test prep centers. Why? To control teachers, to prevent teachers from raising the expectations of working class children. If you recall, this is what teachers were excited about doing in, this, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, there was a lot of ferment in, among educators about uh, how the, the, the working class children had much greater potential than was previously believed about them, especially, you know, black children in the ghetto. There was a big push for open admissions in college to let working class uh, children enter colleges that, in a way that had never happened before. Well, the ruling class didn't like this. Uh, the ruling class needs people to accept uh, the kind of society we have where most people are kept down and and so forth. So teachers had to be attacked, demonized, which is what we've been experiencing for the last several decades. Uh, so they've got standardized tests now that are meant to control teachers, to prevent teachers from raising the expectations of working class children. Uh, the failure rates of these tests are built into, into their design. Uh, the scores in these tests are well known to be highly correlated with family income. So to prevent teachers uh, from doing the very thing that they became teachers to do, that's what, what, what the attack on public schools is all about. A, a, real quick, explain exactly how standardized tests uh, uh, negatively affect kids' education. And uh... Okay, well, there, there, there's two ways. First of all, they're, they're high-stakes standardized tests. That means that that uh, children are not promoted to the next grade and then not even allowed to graduate from high school and get a high school diploma if they can't pass these tests. But the tests have built-in failure rates, so no matter how uh, well the student population learns what, what they supposedly are, are supposed to learn, the bottom, uh, for instance, with the, the Massachusetts uh, standardized test, the MCAS, the bottom quartile uh, is deemed to be uh, Failure, failure, or the other phrase, uh, not proficient. Non proficient, yeah. And and so the bottom quarter of the of the population of students taking the test are going to be failure, non proficient, even if they were all Albert Einstein. Because because it's going to be a spread of scores, and they take the bottom quarter and label them failure, non proficient, no matter how well that bottom quarter did. They, they use they use a, a bell curve grading. Yeah, it's called it's called norm reference. Uh, these tests uh, are are presented to the public as if they were to use the jargon criterion reference. An example of a criterion reference test that people are familiar with is the little written test that you have to to get I guess 70 percent uh, right when you uh, to apply for a driver's license. You know, so you get the manual to, about the rules of the road. You read it. You take a written test. If you get seven out of ten right, uh, you pass. Well, if everybody gets at least seven out of ten right, then everybody passes. That's a uh, criterion reference test. Parents are being led to believe that the the standardized tests are to make just you know are are, li are like the driver's uh, test. That if everyone does well, everyone will will pass. 
the, they're, they're told, for example, that, um, that the test is really just to make sure that the high school graduates know how to make change properly, stuff like that. Uh, but that's not the reality. The reality is that the questions are modified uh, deliberately uh, based on seeing how the questions were, you know, how many people got a certain question right or wrong when they're used as just t uh, not to calculate a score, but just put in an early version that, that the kids take. Some of the questions uh, are, are being, it, it's the question which is being tested to see you know how, what, how many people get it right and wrong, so that when the question is is in a, a later version of the test for people next year, uh, they know how many people are probably going to get it right or wrong, and then they can select the questions in order to to make sure that a certain number do poorly on the test. What you're saying is that questions that everyone gets right are yeah, eliminated from the test. That's right, that's right, right. Because they, they don't right. want... So, in other words, a question on the, on the driver's test that everyone gets right, like, you know, what should you do when you come to a stop sign or whatever, right? You know, it's, if it's an important question, it's left on the test, even though everyone gets it right, but not on, on the uh, standardized test, not with the high stakes in the public school system. So, if kids, if, uh, if, if the whole class of eighth graders, let's say, um, did... did uh, the, the only way for a, a, a class of 8th graders to uh, pass the test, uh, for everyone to pass the test, uh, well, it's impossible. Well, uh, in a particular school, everyone could pass, but, but across the state, a quarter of them are going to be failure non-proficient. And, and guess who those, 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 you know, which schools in the state, that's going to be mainly the case. It's going to be the poorest ones with the lowest family incomes because the tests are well known to basically be highly correlated in the scores of the test with family income. Uh, and, and so the, the, the way that, that the tests work is that they, they're used to send the message to the, most, the poorest working class kids that you don't deserve a, a decent paying job uh, in society when you grow up because you are either too dumb to deserve it or you, or it's your own fault because you didn't work hard and study hard enough in school to deserve a decent job so shame on you uh, the, the idea is to make uh, the children uh, blame themselves for the terrible inequality and injustice of our social system instead of blaming the 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 unjust social system. Now, the the way it controls the teachers is that the teachers more and more their whole careers, uh, whether they get fired or not, or, or or you know promoted and raised, get normal raises, more and more are are being determined by the outcomes of these standardized tests. So more and more they're being told that they have to essentially turn their classroom into a te test prep center where nothing. Is, is discussed or explored uh, unless it directly relates to, to answering the questions on the test correctly. And this is now being uh, used to, to get teachers to become basically robotic script readers in the classroom where they are literally given a script and, and have to follow the script. And, and, and it's, it's turning the classrooms into places that make children intensely dislike education, reading it in the elementary school uh, under the influence of, of Bill Gates and Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, uh, in the common, the so-called uh, common core curriculum that's being enforced from above by these kinds of people, uh, is, is making the learning of reading something that makes children hate reading. It's taking all the fun and enjoyment out of reading. Uh, it's almost like they want to go back to, in the direction of the way it was when slaves were not allowed to be taught to read in, in the 1800s and under slavery in the United States. Well, okay, now you're allowed to read, but they're going to make sure you hate it. Uh, yeah, kids are actually, uh, you know, having nervous breakdowns uh, because they're so stressed out about the tests and they're 
throwing oh, it's a, up. It's a form of child abuse. It, it, uh, what you know, you got I mean, yeah. fourth graders vomiting because of you know anxiety about their whole life being at stake on some stupid test. Teachers hate it, and and it's being shoved down everyone's throat, and uh, and the purpose is to to make our the inequality of our of our uh, social system uh, something that the people will be. Uh, required to tolerate and blame themselves for it. Yeah, and, and there's resistance to these tests and, and changes, uh, policies in education around the country. So yeah, there are places where teachers look are refusing, them up. refusing to give the test. And, we'll put some links in. And things like that. Uh, so, so that's the problem. Uh, so how should it be? In an egalitarian society, in every local community, the people who value equality and mutual aid, in other words, the very great majority, whom we call egalitarians, should be the ones, and the only ones, who decide policy for the schools of the community. No agents of a higher level government, or as is the case today, rich people like Bill Gates, will be allowed to dictate how we choose to educate our children. Okay, let's let's switch now to healthcare. Big money makes good healthcare a commodity that many cannot afford, even though they work as hard as anybody else, often harder. Try being a waitress or a waiter to appreciate how hard. Well, all who are willing to work reasonably in a good society, in an egalitarian society, should have as good health care as they need that is as good as what anybody else receives, period. There's no reason why not. Let's talk about food insecurity. Lots of families aren't sure where their next meal is going to come from in the United States today because even though the parents or the parents work hard, the pay is too low to make ends meet at the end of the month. How should it be? In an egalitarian society, all who are willing to work reasonably should enjoy good, nutritious, and delicious food with as much security as anybody else. Period. Why not? Housing. Lots of families are homeless, even though the parent or parents are willing to work reasonably. At the same time, rich families own multiple mansions. How should it be? All who are willing to work reasonably should enjoy comfortable and adequate housing just as much as anybody else. Why not? Jobs. Lots of people today are unemployed, even though they are willing, even desperate, to work reasonably. So why are they unemployed? It's because no employer can make a profit by hiring them. And no nonprofit organization or government has enough money to hire them because big money controls how the money for these organizations is budgeted. In an egalitarian society, there would be no involuntary unemployment. Instead of being based on profit, the economy would be based on those who work reasonably, producing things and services for each other and sharing them freely with each other according to need and reasonable desire, not buying and selling them. Anybody looking for work could just pitch in where others were already working. This would mean either that everyone could work less there and produce the same amount and enjoy more leisure, or people could work the same as before and produce more because there's more people working. The decision would be made democratically by those in the local community who are for equality and mutual aid. The egalitarians, in other words, the great majority of people. If everybody, uh, excuse me, if somebody couldn't pitch in anywhere because they lacked the necessary skills or knowledge, then they could attend school or be an apprentice to learn what they needed to learn. And this would count as reasonable work, so they would still be able to have, for free, the things and services that they reasonably need or desire, just like anybody else. 
And by the way, things that are too scarce to be freely available this way would be equitably rationed according to need in a manner determined democratically by the egalitarians of the community. Of course, somebody who is not willing to work reasonably would not have any right to the fruits of the economy. They would be essentially beggars. What is or is not reasonable work would be decided democratically by the egalitarians in the local community. Undoubtedly, they would think that children, retired people, and those unable to work would be counted as people doing reasonable work, even though they did no work. People taking care of children or anybody else would be considered as doing reasonable work. But somebody, who most people would expect to do some work, but who simply refuses with an attitude of, work is not for people like me, I'm special, would no doubt be excluded from the category of those who work reasonably and be denied its benefits. As I said, they'd be essentially a beggar. What about uh, on-the-job working conditions, pay, benefits, and management decisions? Most workers in the world, including the United States, are paid way too little compared to what they deserve, and their working conditions are worse than, the, than what they could and should be. This is because businesses are operated by the owners, the capitalists, to make a profit. Profit comes from paying workers less than the value their labor adds to the commodity they produce, which, which commodity the capitalists wrongly claim to own instead of the workers who produced it. When the capitalists sell the commodity, that extra value that was created by the workers is the profit. It is equal to the price obtained for the commodity when it's sold in the marketplace minus the cost of production, the cost of raw materials, machines, workspace, software, maintenance of machines, etc., and the cost of wages and benefits and money spent on working conditions. If the capitalists used all of the value workers added to the commodity for wages and benefits and decent working conditions, then the price obtained for the commodity when it is sold would be no greater than the cost of production. Capitalism, producing for profit, must deprive workers of what they are rightfully owed to make a profit. And that's why we need to abolish capitalism with an egalitarian revolution, have an economy that's not based on profit, but people sharing amongst themselves what they produce uh, freely, according to need. In an egalitarian society run only by egalitarians, as I've said, meaning people who support the values of equality and democracy and mutual aid, which is the great majority of people, the question of how much workers should be paid does not even arise. Why not? Because workers are not paid a wage or a salary. People who work reasonably are all equally allowed to take for free whatever products or services they want according to need or reasonable desire, with scarce things, as I mentioned before, being rationed according to need in an equitable manner determined by all the egalitarians in the local community democratically. Who decides what is reasonable and what is an equitable manner for rationing? These are decided by all the egalitarians in the local community democratically, and only by them, not by any higher governmental body, like the Central Committee, if you will. Management decisions, what to produce, how to produce it, including working conditions, who to give, not sell, the product or service to. Well, today, these decisions are made by capitalists for the purpose of maximizing profits. In an egalitarian society, all the workers in an economic enterprise are equal. There is no owner who bosses the employees around. 
The workers in an enterprise democratically make all of the decisions that today are made by the owners of the business or their paid managers. These decisions are made in the context of a government based on voluntary federation, which I'm going to talk about next. This means that the final authority on how the resources of a local community are to be used rests in the local assembly at which all the egalitarians of the community and only they are invited to determine as equals the policies that particular economic enterprises must adhere to. These policies in turn implement the egalitarian principle that decisions about what products and services to produce, their quality and manner of production, and the people they are given to, not sold, need to reflect the values of equality and mutual aid. Now, local assemblies of egalitarians mutually agree with other local assemblies from other regions or territory to share products and services among all who work reasonably according to need and reasonable desire. We call this a sharing economy. Each local assembly, when deciding what is reasonable for its community, will want to make decisions that are seen as reasonable by the other local communities with whom they're in a sharing economy, because otherwise the mutual agreement to share products and services among many local communities would come to an end, to everybody's disadvantage. These mutual agreements among local communities are facilitated by the local assemblies sending delegates to meet with delegates from other local assemblies and to hammer out proposals for the local assemblies to carry out or not as the local assemblies wish. The delegates craft proposals. They do not write laws. In practice, there is back and forth negotiating between local assemblies and the delegates uh, crafting a proposal until a proposal is worked out that enough assemblies agree with to make it actually happen. We call this kind of government voluntary federation. In an egalitarian society, the workers would no longer be taken advantage of by a wealthy capitalist class claiming, wrongly, to own everything that people need to produce the products and services we need or desire. Workers would be the equal of everybody else and would participate in making all the decisions that today are made by the capitalist class. Instead of profit-driven decisions making the lives of working people worse than they should be, decisions will be made by working people themselves to make life as safe and secure and enjoyable for everybody as humanly possible. Let me switch now to U.S. foreign policy. Just as the very rich use the United States government to protect the wealth and privilege and power of the very rich inside the United States, they also use it to protect the wealth, and privilege, and power of the very rich in foreign countries. The main conflict in the world is between ordinary people with egalitarian values, regardless of their nationality or race or religion or ethnicity, and privileged ruling elites, regardless of their nationality or race or religion or ethnicity. The American billionaire class's primary concern in its foreign policy is to prevent ordinary people from taking over any part of the world, because if they did it anywhere, it would inspire ordinary people to do it elsewhere. This is why the very rich use the United States government's military, economic, and diplomatic power to support anti-democratic and oppressive regimes around the world. This is why the United States government supports ruling elites and foreign governments when they commit terrible crimes to control their people, such as Israel's ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, Saudi Arabia's denial of equal rights to women and harsh exploitation of foreign workers, and China's brutal repression of workers in its sweatshops and violent attacks on farmers protesting how the Communist Party oppresses them. When the egalitarians in the United States, which I keep emphasizing, the great majority of people, in other words, are finally the ones deciding how the wealth and power of the United States will be used, then, for sure, it will stop being used to protect the wealth and power of a privileged few 
and start being used to support the efforts of ordinary people around the world to make the world equal and democratic. No longer will unjust wars based on lies be waged in our name, and no longer will ethnic cleansing of Palestinians be supported in our name. Well, let me switch now to uh, what I call City Hall and Rich Developers versus Neighborhood Residents. This is very local kind of perspective now. All too often, the residents of a neighborhood who are trying to make their neighborhood a beautiful, comfortable, and desirable place to live are frustrated by City Hall and rich developers who just want to use the neighborhood to make the rich richer. Developers come in with plans that neighborhood residents object to. City Hall allows the residents to come to hearings and write letters, but it does little good because the City Hall politicians are beholden to the rich far more than to ordinary residents. And money is power in our society, in other words. An egalitarian revolution would end this injustice. It would create a society, first of all, with no rich and no poor, and an economy that was not based on profit, but rather producing the things and services that people, as equals, need and want, to be shared freely according to need and reasonable desire amongst those who work reasonably. So there would be no rich developers. Instead, people whose reasonable work was designing and building and maintaining developments would only get a green light to construct a new development when the local community assembly gave them the green light. The local community assembly is open to all egalitarians in the local community, i.e., as I've said, people who support equality, democracy, and mutual aid, the great majority, and it's open only to them. And they have an equal say in its decisions. This way, developments would be what neighborhood residents want, not what rich developers out to make a big profit force them to grudgingly accept. Well, that ends the partial list of, of uh, grievances that many of us have that are caused by the dictatorship of the rich. The, this list will be added to. I hope you uh, go to pdrboston.org where the link is uh, your issue is our issue and um, and maybe send us uh, an email with suggestions for what to add to it. Thank you.